Welcome to our first ever online class at Proverbs 31 Ministries. We are thrilled to have you join us. I want to begin with a warning. Put your Bible study student hat on. We're going to be moving fast. At times, it'll feel like we're drinking out of a fire hose together, truly. But our topic today, why we can trust the Bible, doesn't have a simple answer. It has many facets, and I don't want to leave a single one out. To help keep us connected throughout the teaching, we've created an outline for you to follow along. Are you ready? Let's go. As a ministry, we receive many questions about the Bible, but two of the most common questions we encounter are, how do we know we can trust the Bible? And could this collection of manuscripts written by 40 different writers over thousands of years in varying languages, Hebrew, some Aramaic, and Koine Greek, really be the divinely inspired word of God? I found myself asking these very same questions in my early 20s. My parents told me the Bible was true. My Sunday school teachers taught me it was true. I felt like it was true because I trusted those people. But a few days after my college graduation, I experienced a tragedy that caused me to question everything my parents and my church told me about God and the Bible. I remained in that painful place of doubt and uncertainty for a lot of years. And what I discovered in my journey back to trusting God and His Word is that to move from feeling the Bible is true to knowing the Bible is true required one thing, reading it for myself, doing the hard work, sitting down and studying what it said, exposing my heart to God's Word this way and to people who knew and trusted His Word completely shifted my perspective on Scripture. The doubt, the struggle, and the challenges I issued to God I realized they weren't bad. In fact, they were good. They had me wrestling with God and with the text until God untangled the thousand-year-old words I held in my hand. They came alive in my heart and moved me from feeling to knowing the Bible is true. I experienced its life-transforming power in ways that changed the trajectory of my life forever. And that's our goal today, to expose our hearts to God's Word and to biblical scholars who have dedicated their lives to studying it. So together, we can move beyond feeling to actually knowing with confidence what we believe about the Bible, why we believe it, and in learning the what and the why, how to better live and communicate what we believe. So we're gonna accomplish our goal by examining both external and internal evidence. I'm a trial lawyer by training. I learned early in my career the importance of evidence. The more convincing it is, the more likely it is to sway a judge or jury. The key to convincing evidence is first, trustworthy eyewitnesses, and second, credible physical and scientific evidence. When presenting a case, I knew both would increase a judge or jury's confidence in me. The same principle applies when we talk about our faith, but on an even greater scale. But greater because we aren't talking about taking one side or another on a legal matter. We're talking about the trustworthiness of the Bible and the one who inhabits its pages. Credible eyewitnesses and convincing physical and scientific evidence are critical building blocks to a deeper, more grounded faith. Let's begin our time together today by examining external evidence, evidence outside the Bible, specifically eyewitness testimony. The reason judges and juries value eyewitness testimony is because the people speaking actually saw the events about which they're testifying. Like courtroom eyewitnesses, the authors of the Bible testified about what they saw and heard, but they're different from courtroom eyewitnesses because of who they were, especially Jesus' disciples. They didn't just write about what they saw or heard on one or two occasions. The disciples closely followed the one about whom they testified. They knew his heart, he was their master, their teacher, their leader, and this caused them to be very attentive to every word, every movement, and direction Jesus gave. It made them excellent eyewitnesses. Have you ever wondered if the very first eyewitnesses of Jesus' work on earth kept notes or journals? I think I would have, documenting every word and miracle I saw. We don't have evidence they did, and I'm thinking journal writing probably would have been difficult considering their way of life. Written testimonies of Jesus' life, ministry, and teachings only began to emerge as word spread about the martyring of the disciples. So as we consider the New Testament books of the Bible, not all the New Testament books and letters were written by what we call first-hand eyewitnesses. Some were John's Gospel and letters, Peter's letters, and Paul's letters. And it's important to note, though Paul was not one of the 12 apostles, he had a personal encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. 
For the books not written by first-hand eyewitnesses, those authors still wrote from first-hand information and that significance to the trustworthiness of their words. Let's use the Gospel of Mark as an example. Scholars believe John Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark. Though not an actual eyewitness to Jesus' ministry, he was in a unique position to write the Gospel because of his close friendship with Peter, who was one of Jesus' 12 apostles. Mark's close relationship with Peter and the specificity with which he wrote bring credibility to his Gospel because he wrote through Peter's eyes. The New Testament authors themselves testified they were actual eyewitnesses to what they wrote. In fact, their eyewitness testimony led early Christians to trust their writings as authoritative and sacred. Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1.16, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were witnesses of His majesty. And then John wrote in 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, That which was from the beginning, that which we heard, that which we've seen with our eyes, that which we've looked at and touched with our hands, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. And what we're learning isn't limited to the New Testament. New Testament writers recognize the Old Testament writings also to be holy, sacred, God-given texts. Listen to Peter's words in 2 Peter 1.21. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3.16, it's a verse we often hear in Christian circles, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Did you notice Paul's words? Not just the Old Testament, not just the New Testament. Paul says all scripture, the entire Bible. Jesus' own words validate the Old Testament. I love this part. Jesus began his ministry quoting from the Old Testament when confronting the devil in the wilderness. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is taken from Matthew 4.4, 4, quoting from Deuteronomy 8.3. Some of Jesus' last words from the cross quote from the Old Testament. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Taken from Matthew 27, 46, quoting from Psalm 22, 1. And then another one, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Taken from Luke 23, 46, quoting from Psalm 31, 5. Finally, early believers circulated the New Testament letters among their churches, believing the letters were authoritative eyewitness teachings, revelations from God. The eyewitness testimony we've just summarized is compelling evidence as we together begin to build our case for the trustworthiness of God's word.